Welcome everyone to the third Bookseller You Do webinar. This webinar is looking specifically at the issue of the children's ebook market, and we've got some uh, great speakers sharing their knowledge of what they've done. First up is um, Rich Stevenson, who is CEO and founder of You Do. He's built up the business since 2003. He's passionate about publishing and using the appropriate technology to deliver business goals. We've then got Morton Durr, who's a Danish self-published author, and he's worked specifically in the iBooks marketplace with his children's books. So he will talk about how he's been doing and what is next for him. Thirdly, we've got Anne Marshall, publisher of Ripley Publishing. Uh, the last webinar, Anne spoke about their plans for publishing uh, via the iBooks bookstore and now she's going to come back and tell us how those ebooks have sold and also what plans they have for the future. So um, starting with Richard. Good. Um, I'll just take over from the, uh, the controls and then I'll While Richard's just sorting things out, I will um, just to say there will be some time for questions at the end. So use the questions box in the webinar panel or simply, if it's easier, email them directly to me. I'm philip.jones at bookseller.co.uk. Good. Um, right. We can see the slides. Thank you very much. Um, just uh, very briefly, uh, Philip kindly introduced ourselves. We, we've been publishing onto the web. Um, for publishers since 2003. That's really um, across the range of publishing, not only book publishers, but in the space of, um, of magazines and, and many other forms of publications. And we've done that really since 2007 through a cloud publishing system. And we publish a lot of publications a day, in fact, up to 1,200 publications a day. Um, in the app side, we've got more than 220 iPad apps and iPhone apps live. But um, we have also been a provider of fixed layout EPUB conversion services uh, for a number of publishers uh, to take particular advantage of Apple's move to get more structured uh, um, solutions for fixed page layouts or layouts that have got the importance of maintaining that original structure in the design. And we've done that for Weldon Owen in the States, which is part of Bonnier. Um, uh, particularly for their very strong range of cookbooks. Random House, people from Martha Stewart's Quadril Publishing, we're working with Ripley's, as we'll be hearing from Anne later on, and In Easy Steps, which is more an education side of things. And in Fixed Layout, which is obviously quite different to normal EPUB, we've got more than 200 Fixed Layout publications which have been completed. So, um, We've been investing time in looking at how we can make these publications more interactive. And I think from the children's books point of view, we were uh, very aware that standard EPUB has little appeal to children. It's got no interactivity. It's um, uh, certainly the ones that are on the EPUB um, uh, devices that are black and white renderers um, have not got the appeal or the ability to refresh the screen to give you interactivity. Um, so. The first device, of course, that gave us the possibility was the iPad. And then we've seen some other ones come on with the, uh, the Kindle Fire. And we'll be talking about this later on and, and the Barnes and & Noble Nook. Um, but from our point of view, what the um, interesting thing about having the, the uh, device that could actually give us a sort of proper refresh rate was that um, what could we do with the inter interactivity? So we could actually use that for children's books to make it much more exciting for the child, um, depending on what age group we're talking about things, but you can certainly drill down for more information or alternatively make things happen on the screen. And up to that point, up to the point of which um, you can use them on the aggregator stores, the only way of doing that was in, uh, in, in more complex and more expensive apps. So, so far we've taken the view that the children's ebook marketplace has not really yet taken off, partly because the product hasn't been quite right for the right price, price point. And we want to review that today. So it really needs to be in fixed layout format for children's books. That's, you know, they tend to be 
layouts, illustrated books that have got a lot of richness about them, a lot of interesting structure. And uh, Anne's books in, in Ripley, for example, are, are quite complex in layout, and they would uh, never translate properly into normal EPUB. And it needs to be in fixed layout because you have this ability to sort of put text and, and layouts in different ways. Now, the fixed layout EPUB um, can be enhanced. And when we talk about enhanced ebooks, this is not about a st uh, standard sort of text um, where we drop in some video. Um, the way that for children's books, we need to do much more. The actual background needs to be very exciting and interesting, colorful, and, uh, and well designed. But certainly, the, the audio and the video insertions can definitely make uh, books more interesting. And if you take them outside the, the children's book arena, Things like author interviews are very, very useful to know, uh, you know something about who the author was. It adds a richness to that experience. If you're reading the book and you know something about who the author is in more than just words. Um, so those are the, there's easy ways to do things. That's the first level of, uh, of interactivity. Um, but it's more or less delivering experience rather than actually any feedback from the actual uh, user or the child involved. The read aloud ebooks. Um, I think are very exciting, and we, we've done some very interesting read aloud books for, for many clients. And uh, this is where it's not just your um, having the page and having the page read to you. I think what's interesting is we we take it down to the actual word itself. So um, yes, you're using a real voice. You're not using a, a computer generated voice, which I think is very very important. Uh, so you can hear the actual intonation of the reader. So you can have a very good reader who's reading it, and the text is then followed by a highlighted uh, uh, following of, of the actual word. And you, the reader can go back and click on that and get it heard again. So you can actually make this connection between the actual word and the actual spelling of the word as well. And that helps for pronunciation, to understand that, say, how does that word actually sound? Uh, and it helps people who are having difficulty in reading because they can actually hear the sound and actually see how it is actually spelled on the page. So by marrying up the real, um, the real voice of a narrator with the actual, down to the actual word, I think is a very exciting and, uh, uh, development and one which I think we've got a lot of big future for, uh, particularly in education and early learning. And the interactivity element, the last one, is things like in HTML5 and, and quizzes. The, um, the only thing I would say about the quizzes element of things, particularly on the iBook store, is that the, um, the books themselves don't have the ability to, to cache what you've done. In other words, that you may sort of fill in something on a quiz, you may then turn the page, and then you go back, and you still start again. So it doesn't actually save what you have actually done. If you want to do that, we do that in apps quite successfully, um, but in the actual iBook store, for example, that uh, feature does not uh, exist so far. So you have to design your your quizzes for those uh, for that situation. Um, so moving on, what we've actually done is to give an example, and there's going to be um, uh, an example of this put on the iBook store very shortly, um, which will be called the UDo animation examples. And we've developed 12 ways in which animations can be done. Uh, and that's almost to give um, a, a, some sort of fre fre uh, terminology, if you like, to how to describe how animation should work. And um, this is a list of these things, like stampable. And stampable is something that Apple uses the same terms, where um, the child can hit the page with their finger and something will happen. Some, uh, some object will appear. Sound triggers, where um, there will be a dog, and they, the child can touch the dog, and the dog will bark. Things like deferred events is when uh, the page is turned, and then after a certain time lapse of, of a couple of seconds or something, something will happen or appear on the page. Um, there's flashing elements, elements that will flash and draw attention to them when they're turned over the page. Um, there's some moving object, the animations, the object will move around. Um, elements will float. There will be changing shapes of the animation where you can touch it and it will change shapes. The read aloud feature I've spoken about, um, the, the ability to change things like colors, um, embedding video animation. And on video, by the way, 
these things I've just spoken to about these are relatively lightweight in terms of the um, uh, the uh, memory usage and things on the actual device. If you really want to do more complex animation, which we've done for certain clients, is that we convert this into a video, and that is embedded. So that's a sort of full bleed video that works on the page, and that's very, very effective. But it does have the slight disadvantage of actually being more heavyweight in terms of download. And then you've got things like video triggers, so you could touch on, on, on any particular area of the page, and the trigger, trigger would actually uh, uh, fire a video. And then you have things that are draggable, so you can have an object like a moon, for example, and the child can actually drag that across the page. So what we've done is produce a, a book with all these features in it, um, and they're just a really an example. Uh, it's up to the publishers and the animators to actually work out how best to use some of these features. But um, they, these now are available for um, the iBooks. And one example of that might be, for example, the stampable animation on the left-hand side. Um, that would be just if you clicked on that particular um, video there, um, that would be where you can see um, little um, blossoms, I suppose, that would come in onto the tree. And as the child continued to stamp there, more blossoms would come, as you can see that from the left-hand side. Um, and on the right-hand side of this particular example, um, you would have a change color feature where um, the child would click on uh, the, the boy's shirt and that would actually change to um, a, a different color. And that's just an example of a, a very simple um, types of animation, but it's really up to the animator. That can be made to do all sorts of things in, uh, in, in, in nice graphics. So these are the type of things that are now possible on the iBook store, which, um, you know, four or five months ago were not possible. So things are moving on quite quite uh, uh, dramatically. So um, let's talk about iBooks author. Um, I think most people would have um, been fully aware of Apple's launch into what they build as being the education sector. Um, but in fact, in doing that, they, they launched a, an authoring tool to create textbooks, which is iBooks author. And, uh, and that is effectively a, a more templated version of a, uh, a desktop publishing pro program. And it's got some extremely interesting and good features. And one of them, of course, is that it's free, which is very useful. And it's very easy to use. Um, and certainly the output, if you do it well, can be actually very stunning. So here you've got the ability to produce books using this particular tool. Um, against it, um, it's very much that you are now tying it to the iBook store and the iOS store. And one of the things that is the difference between the fixed page layout and this is that um, fixed page layout is actually not proprietary to, to Apple. There's nothing there that's particularly proprietary. In fact, as I'll explain later, that same code works on, on the Kobo devices. So it's, it's much more portable um, on fixed la page layout. Whereas this is definitely, if you're creating something using iBooks author, it is for the uh, the, the iPad platform um, and uh, the iOS platform. So um, it is for that. I think it's it's template driven. Um, so there is a a sacrifice that certain uh, designers are going to have in terms of how this book is actually going to work. Um, and it's it's very much more difficult to repurpose your existing content. So if you're going to create from new, it's a very interesting, useful tool. And I think it's going to play a major part. Certainly, our experience of speaking to many publishers is that they are they are um, less you know, not so enthusiastic on, the, on on a number of those negative points. They certainly are looking to have their publications available across platforms and not actually um, purely for the, uh, the the iPad, no matter how successful it is. And secondly, a lot of their designs and their layouts are something which are very much almost in their brand and ones which they don't wish to sacrifice um, in order to put it into a more templated structure that you would do in the iBooks author. But nevertheless, it, it is actually a major step forward in, in terms of simplicity and, and sometimes speed to actually produce. The Kobo box, I think you know, most people will be aware that you can buy um, Kobo devices now from WH Smith in the UK, and it's been uh, very successful in, in, uh, in the States. It is um, a device that is definitely at the lower end of the game. 
it's not a it's not going to win any prizes for uh, for design. However, it is a um, it's a device that has got um, and Cobra themselves have got a huge number of books, as most people will know in terms of EPUB. But the Vox is an LCD screen. In other words, it's one that will display color. Um, and it's a small device. It's a seven-inch device. Um, and what they have done is they've taken the same spec as the um, fixed layout EPUB spec. So uh, that is a very useful thing for publishers because we're not having to repurpose things um, for, um, for the Cobra. And so anything done on the iBook, uh, the the, uh, the iPad for the iBook store can also be repurposed onto the Cobra. Um, it does include JavaScript support. However, it doesn't have the ability to play video, which is rather surprising. I suspect this might change. And it doesn't have scalable vector graphics. And just so we can explain that is that um, uh, that's if you want to actually put your text in anything other than a straight line. If you want to use curvy text or um, and um, and uh, Ripley books, for example, make extensive use of this and things. It doesn't actually support any of that on the Kobo uh, box. Um, so there's a few restrictions there, but at least that's useful. The Kindle Fire um, has done extremely well since launch in the States. And some of the stats that we monitor are very interesting because it's quite clear that they are actually not only buying the Kindle Fire, but most importantly, they are um, using it for content. And the stats we were looking at um, very recently, which I've done a number of slides on, um, show that the actual usage of apps, for example, on the Kindle Fire equaled the, the apps on the Samsung. That means both of those are Android platforms um, uh, within the, the first sort of four weeks of uh, Kindle Fire being actually launched. So it's, very, it's gone extremely quickly. Uh, in, in the states, it is not launched over over in the in Europe yet. Um, but the disappointing thing is that they have actually developed their own format, and that's KF8, which is Kindle Format 8. And therefore, um, they've taken a different approach, which means that you can't repurpose the uh, the work that you will have done or we will have done, for example, on the on the iBook Store on the iPad solution. And one of the points to note is that. You have to decide at the beginning whether, in fact, you're going to do, develop your book onto this uh, format in portrait or landscape right at the start of it. And they don't have a zoom facility uh, like in iBooks. They have something called region magnification. So um, when you're building it in the first place, you have to actually decide that you're going to um, switch on re regional mag magnification, which just acts as more as a magnifying glass on certain areas. And this is partly because you know, in this particular format size, which is smaller format size for books, they need some form of magnification, and that's how they've handled it. So it's actually a different way of working. So moving on from the Kindle Fire, um, we have the Nook tablet. Now, in the UK, there's been lots of rumors about whether Watsons are going to um, distribute this particular product or not. Still remains as rumors. But in the States, it's become extremely popular. And for good reason, it's a very good device. I mean, we have most devices. And this is actually a well-built device. And it, uh, most people have used it like it very much. However, they have a format to the children's book called EPIB, not EPUB. And um, I don't know whether that's going to catch on. But certainly, it's EPIB. And you have to use the special Nook application that works only on Macs and at the moment to create content for the Nook kids' books. But um, certainly, because of the popularity, it's certainly well worth considering producing it for the, for the Nook. And uh, we're not sure whether it's going to come in Europe, but certainly in the States, I think doing children's books using EPIB is an interesting option. The thing that most people will now realize is that we haven't got a nice standardized form for this more sophisticated type of um, uh, publishing in terms of using a, uh, more than standard EPUB. Um, with this type of fixed layout, where you're keeping that format the same, is there are multiple different formats. And part of the work that we've been doing with um, the, uh, the Book Industry Study Group is to produce a grid and a table which, in fact, is going to list out in much more detail than I can do on this webinar of where, which, which uh, features can exist on different devices 
and that will help the industry. Um, and this will come out at the end of the month, and you will be able to get access to that. And that you may be very quite useful for, uh, for for many people who are on this call and others. Um, so it will be out on, on the Book Industry Study Group website and, and many other uh, websites uh, after that. So um, let's talk about cost and interactivity. Uh, I said at the right at the beginning that in order to create a lot of activity beforehand, uh, the only really way of doing that was to create individual apps. And there's lots of stories about people spending a fair amount of money per app. And, um, uh, you know, I'm talking about something between 20 to 60,000 pounds, for example, in developing some very interesting apps. But it's very difficult to get the payback on that sort of investment. So many of you will have realized that, you know, that that sort of expenditure, even expenditure more than 5,000 pounds, is difficult to get a payback on some of these um, children's books, particularly. So um, I think this, these new features that are now available are going to really help um, children's books of less than 50 pages. And the reason why I say that is because unlike normal EPUB, which is a reflowable EPUB, which is a low-cost way of producing things, the way that fixed layout that works is HTML page. It's broadly, you can imagine it as being a website page per page. And therefore, and a, a, the more you increase the pagination, the more the cost will go up. But the interesting thing from children's books point of view is many of these are actually relatively short books. Um, 32 pages is not untypical, and it becomes a very cost-effective cost solution. So on the next slide, I've just set out a typical example so people can get their minds around what I mean by the cost differences and what's available. So in this particular example here, I've worked on, say, if there was a 32-page book, and supposedly there were 20 interactive elements uh, in, the, in that book. That book in total would cost somewhere around 700 pounds or just over $1,000. Now, if you put that on the iBook store, selling it, say, £3.99, um, the net income per book, after you take off the agent fee for Apple and the tax that they reduce, particularly the VAT and other sales tax, is that the amount you end up would be, be somewhere around £2.46. Now, what that actually equates to is that you need to sell about 267 books in order to break even. Now, that doesn't include other costs that the publishers may have, like font licenses or maybe rights or other, other costs that are related to them. But that is an idea of just putting you down a figure, which gives you the idea that it is actually a very achievable thing to um, get that degree of payback using these type of interactive tools and making it a, a good experience for kids. And I think that the exciting thing now is that the, the, the tools are there for, um, for books to be made that can excite children at a price point uh, that is sensible and that like cost of development is sensible. I think there's still a lot of questions to be asked about as each one of these platforms get traction in the marketplace, at what point does the publisher convert to that format? because you need to have a fairly reasonable install base before you're going to see a payback. As far as the, um, the iPad's concerned, I think the case is pretty proven. The iPad 3 makes the case even stronger with the retina screen, which is about four times the resolution. And that means that most of the time, you will not need to zoom in order to see things, because the resolution would, would be so much better. And there will be pretty stunning uh, images for, for kids and children's books. So I think the iPad case is made. I think some of the others need to be looked at carefully. But as they grow, then it will make sense to do that. So I'm going to sign off on, on that point. We'll take questions at the end. And I think the, uh, the time is, is really to um, pass the, um, uh, the discussion to Morton, who can talk about his experience. Thank you, Richard. Well, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm a Danish children's author, and uh, I do self-publish some of my e-books. Others are published by my print publisher, so it's a little bit of both. Let's go to the next slide, because um, why did I self-publish? Initially, I just wanted to educate myself about e-books. But I soon found out that it was a good way to control all the little details about ebooks. 
that needs to be addressed, such as pricing, formatting, and the book description that appears in, I, in the iBook store. And uh, also, by self-publishing, I was better to do more personal marketing via, via social media, giving out free copies. For instance, if I'm appearing at a, at a reading at a school somewhere out of town, I can sell a bundle of ebooks for a discounted price to that school. Things like this makes the whole publishing experience more flexible if I can do it myself. Another major point was the ability to activate my back catalog. I'm sure that my publisher would eventually have gotten to that, but uh, I wanted to, to get that process going a lot quicker. And also, of course, the issue about royalty. I wanted a higher royalty than, than could be offered by my publisher at that point. And uh, yeah, let's move on to the next slide. Because one of the most important things I find about self-publishing ebooks is that as an author, I know my books better than anyone, I would say. And uh, they are all quite different. Some are large format picture books, some are novels, other are easy readers. And when all the books are different, they need different approaches. They need a di dif different digital fit. For instance, one book I made through Udo with uh, real out features. Other books I've made myself uh, using software like Apple Pages or the Book Creator app for iPad. And of course, the iBooks author tool from Apple as well. So by doing this myself, or controlling the, the, the conversion process myself, I was able to, finding, to find the right digital fit and doing it very cheap. And let's move on. So how did it go? Well, my two popular, most popular books was uh, available for sale in the iBook store uh, in November. And the first month, they sold 65 and 59 copies, rising to 146 and 65 copies in December. And then in January, they sold 80 and 95 copies. And of course, I do realize that these numbers are not astronomical, but they have to be compared to a normal print run of the same type of books in Denmark. Now, these types of books would normally be printed in, in numbers of 800 or 1,000 uh, for a normal print run, and they would very rarely be uh, reprinted. So I can anticipate that these books will, will outsell the, their print equivalent uh, during 2012. At least that's what I'm hoping for. And then what's next? Um, I think I've learned a few things now. And uh, one of the major is issues is that I need a new creative and, and a new editing process uh, because I will have to develop my books for digital and print at the same time. That would, for instance, mean that uh, I would have to work more closely with an illustrator from the start. Normally, when I make a book, I sit down and write the book and uh, send it to, to my publisher. And they will then uh, edit the book. And at the very end, we will bring in the, the illustrator. That process will need to be reversed. I will work closely with my illustrator. And for our next project, we will make the book chapter by chapter. And when we have some rough editions of a chapter, we will post them online for free and uh, have reader feedback on those chapters. And then when we've run through these cycles of, of editing and writing and, and uh, illustrating, then we'll submit it to, to a print publisher. Uh, at least that's my idea for now. 
So, yeah, that's my input for now, I think. And over to Anne. Hi. Um, I'm Anne Marshall, publisher of Ripley Publishing. Um, we've had, I think, quite an interesting six months, um, or nine months probably now, almost a year, looking at all the e-books. And our books really, as Richard said earlier, just not suited to e-book layout. So the fixed layout has really suited us extremely well because our books are very heavily illustrated. Um, particularly our annual, which we set, we spend um, a nine months creating, and every single page is labored over the design, the layout, and content. So um, there's no way we could have actually produced that on anything other than the fixed layout of EPUB. So in the last six months, we've actually created 20 um, e-books, um, which are not, not great numbers like some of the bigger publishers who do a lot of fiction. For us, it's actually quite substantial because it's um, two of our biggest series, plus also um, our annual, which um, was a kind of, we had to make a decision about that one, but um, we've gone with it, and uh, I must say I'm thrilled with what it looks like. So we ha now have 20 books we've created, some that fixed layout and some just EPUB format. Um, so the ones that are not fixed layout and have gone out really into all the, all the markets and are distributed um, worldwide by our, um, our distributor. Um, but the ones on the iPad um, are the ones we've kept there, and we really feel we don't want to do anything with them until we can guarantee that the devices will actually um, be able to present them and showcase them in the same way. And I, I, I think I explained this when I came on last, I feel quite strongly that we need to maintain the same standards in publishing, and we need to hold them up and make absolutely sure that we don't bastardize our theories or the look of them or anything um, and rush them out. So we're taking it quite carefully. So we've had eight of our twists series out for quite a few months now, um, and the annual went out in December, and we've had, the, the twists were fine, they've been around, around for quite a time, and we uploaded them, and I've been extremely surprised, we had no expectations, I had no knowledge of the market as most of us haven't, there's no history, if it's a hardback book I know exactly, I can feel I know exactly how it's going to do, and where it's going to go, and instinctively you can work out the sums, but with the um, fixed layout EPUBs, and EPUB publishing, there was no history. It's really, really hard. So we had, I had no expectations, really. Um, and I don't particularly want to go into actual sales, but I must say we've done surprisingly well. Um, um, more than I thought we have sold, particularly the twist series, which were featured by Apple for quite a few weeks, and I think that probably helped enormously. Um, so our annual is something different because that's a really big beast, and most of all that's a very much a gift book where people flex through it. So again, I didn't have many expectations of that, and so far that has done, again, surprisingly well, although against what, I'm not sure, because I wasn't really sure what was going to happen to it. Um, but I think what's interesting is that there are so many decisions to make, it's not just a matter of putting it up, which we've found we've had to look very carefully at because we do a million um, a year of our annual and it goes out into the trade. Um, we've had to be very careful about when we put it out so we don't sort of tread on the toes of the big retailers who help us. There's a, we had to be quite sensitive about this and there was a lot of sensitivity about if we'd sort of um, heavily advertised that we were putting our ebook version out before Christmas. I think it might have upset some retailers so we had to be very careful when we put it out and it didn't actually get put up onto the Apple store until about I think it was about 14th or 15th of December, so um, that was a decision we had to take very carefully. Um, I think the pricing has been quite a nightmare because we did, I did a massive great research document on what people were charging, but there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason, so that's been again a very hard um, lesson to look at, um, and we've kind of been testing, and I think perhaps that's what one needs to do. We've been putting different prices. The twists are quite good because they're eight series, so we can test one against the other. So we've taken one, reduced the price, and made it free. We've done a few variations, and it's quite interesting to see how it definitely tracks differently when you start playing around with the price. So that's something we, we intend to do more of um, on our titles, just to see what, how, what the market can stand and how people respond to that. Um, the annual is tricky, um, and we've set a price for that, and we're leaving it as it stands at the moment. Um, but I do think one needs to be very flexible about these kind of things. Um, I mean, I think one of the interesting things that 
Morton said is that the annual with us, it's a, a living copies, it goes out there in three months or two months almost, it's gone. By the time you get to January, it's quite difficult to find copies of the book. Um, it's sold out, there might be a few special deals trickling through February, but then it's gone. And what's really interesting about the annual is it's up on the um, Apple store, and it's going to stay there until the next one comes out. So there's a kind of longevity in it, which possibly was missed out before in the hardback market. So I'm quite interested in that. Um, and I must say, as an aside, I think it looks absolutely fantastic. I think the iPad is such a showcase for, for titles. It's just, it looks absolutely amazing, the definition and everything. So I'm quite excited to have a look at the, the version 3. Um, so promotion. Promotion is difficult. We cross promote everything. So in the back of all our books now, for the twist, we have a clickable page at the back. So if you read one, you can actually click straight on and purchase other ones. Um, the annual, we have um, a big advertisement in the back. We, at every single opportunity now, we, um, if it's appropriate, we actually advertise the fact that we've got e-books. And, um, you know, it's, 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 a difficult, um, it's a difficult thing to do to get discoverability. Um, and again, we're learning exactly how how to do this and what we're doing. Um, we do take an integrated marketing approach across the company. Um, we have many opportunities because we are, as a branded company, we have museums. Um, we're building an app program. We've got um, the book publishing. We've got branding and so on. So, and, and book sales and other products. So everything now is becoming much more integrated. And it's something you have to think about. It's not it's almost instinctively you'll send something off to print and think, gosh, we haven't included this and the e-books and the app. So it's, it's a learning curve for all of us that we need to cross-integrate all our digital books, our apps, or everything. Um, but actually, I quite like it because it does feel quite easy. It doesn't feel hard. Once we do it, the whole thing sort of fits in quite ne neatly, and we can sort of cross um, market all our products in, in a way more easily than we did before where it was kind of books and museums and that kind of thing. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of thinking about it. It's a lot of creativity. And once you put them up, you can't just sit and let them sit there. You've got to work with the pricing um, and look at it all. Um, and we're increasing. We're putting up more. We're putting up our next annual with interactive stuff, I hope, as well. But um, I think overall, as I say, I don't particularly want to discuss sales, but we've certainly recouped our investment in them. And um, I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, I mean, when I look around at people with iPads, I do a lot of cross-Atlantic, transatlantic um, shuttle on the, um, over to Orlando. So there's a lot of kids on the plane. So I'm always looking out. And there's a lot of very young kids. I've not seen a lot of sort of 7 to 10 kids actually were playing or looking at iPads. So I have to say I'm quite interested and quite encouraged by the number of titles. Um, that have been sold, um, which all our books kind of go in the younger range, in at that range, the number of titles have been sold. So um, I think very encouraged, um, and we're certainly going to go on forward, and pleasantly surprised, I think, really. Um, so yeah, it's been a very good experience for us. And it's Richard here. Um, OK, great. thank you all I'm very much. That was very interesting. Richard, uh, so I've got a question for you actually whilst you're on the line, Richard. Um, the way you talk about the um, fixed layouts, what's happening in the iBookstore, all, sort of, all reminds me of what publishers have previously been calling apps. Is there a sort of a natural distinction there that you can come up with between an app and an iBook? And a, a, a follow-up question would be, is it better for publishers, do you think, to be in the app store or the iBook store? Um, Philip, I think... Um, it's a very, very, very good point, and it, it's a big point of debate. The um, we we now do we do both. Okay, so we have a nice window on what is the right way to do things. Now, the simple definition is the app is uh, standing there separately on the app store, and it isn't part of the aggregator store, which is, if you like, the iBook store. The iBook store is, in fact, an app. It happens to be a native Apple app, and uh, so the main advantage of being on the iBook store is discoverability in that sense people will the traffic will go to the iBook store but uh, the disadvantage of being there is uh, you are restricted to what Apple will expect you can do on that particular app if you have an, an app that's your standalone app you have the ability to do many more things that you're outside of those restricted ways because obviously if you're going to put it onto the iBook store Apple needs things to go into a standard format 
in order for it to work. And therefore, what is technically possible is not necessarily allowed because they want to actually shoehorn it into standardization. That doesn't apply to apps. So what we're finding is that publishers who have a series or an interesting uh, group that can be found well, in other words, there may be a target group of people, some of them, say, for example, in education are within um, various uh, groups of teachers that are easily discoverable, will have their resources in an app because they can market to them very easily. And inside the app, the, um, the reading experiences and the, uh, the interactivity things can be um, tailored more closely, if that answers the question to you uh, for that. I think increasingly we're going to see um, people doing a mix of two of both. And uh, the advantage of having your own app is that you're not just merely selling the book itself, but you actually are building a community of users and you get to know who your end users are. So you can cross-sell and you can promote to them. So if somebody has a, a an app, they will download it onto their device and th they will now have your app on their device and you can then publish more content to that app which will then uh, drive the content to all those users. So over time you build a community and that becomes a valuable resource for publishers. So I think it's going to, we're going to see more apps like that develop and more micro bookstores if you like that, um, that can be developed. Uh, the, di the difference is, is, is the thing to think about is can you be discovered as an app like that way and how do you, how do you make that happen in terms of social media or the, 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 the group that you're heading for. But it's, it's, it's quite a, a, a big difference between an app and going on the aggregator stores. And do you think, from your from your knowledge of Apple, do you think Apple's putting now more um, umph behind the iBook Store now that it's working out its, um, its its formats and helping publishers publish more cheaply in that in the iBooks format? Uh, they they definitely. Are. I think that I would say that the first experience of the iBook Store, I think Apple was disappointed. They expected to get uh, much more traction against Amazon than they actually did. And so they really have upped their, um, their input as far as, um, uh, like the iBooks author is one attempt, one for example, to, to leapfrog things and provide people with a tool to create publications. Um, the other is that what I've been talking about recently well, in, this, in this particular presentation on this, these ability to drop animations in. Um, six months ago when we dropped in some animations in JavaScript, Apple was rejected it because they didn't have a standard for it. And now they, they do have a standard for it. So they are trying to make it a more uh, sort of uh, interactive experience. And they, they are investing more to do that. Um, and they can do that because the big seller for, for Amazon is, is the Kindle. But that has limitations on interactivity. Um, but the Kindle Fire is the one that they regard as being the, uh, the closest threat. Um, and, and they, at the moment, have much lower levels of interactivity than Apple. But Apple will want to keep pushing forward to keep ahead of uh, what Amazon may come up with. Just so we've got 15 minutes for questions, so um, do ask questions in the uh, question panel on the, on the webinar um, control screen. Uh, Morton, I've got a question for you. Are you, are you unusual in Denmark in, in, in self-publishing uh, your children's books, or are there others also similarly experimenting? There are, yes. I, I, it's not so unusual, but I guess I'm, I'm unusual in that respect that um, I have a long history of, of publishing print books with the largest publishers. So um, taking the leap to self-publishing is, is maybe a bit odd, but uh, I find it necessary to, uh, to gain this experience and knowledge about e-books at this point. And how will you use that knowledge in the future? Will you help your publishers publish better books, or will you uh, continue to cut them out of the loop for your future titles? No, uh, a little bit of both, actually, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, um, that's, that's open for debate. Um, right now, I want to explore how the iBooks author tool can help me as, as an author express myself and, and make good-looking e-books. Now, uh, if I publish them myself, or would my publisher publish them? I don't know. It's, it's also a question about economics, and we will have to be, debate that.
Mm. Yeah, I was surprised what you said about your publishers not <coughs> digitizing your, your backlist or you being able to do it quicker than than them. Is that is I mean is that also unusual in in Denmark or do you think no. do you think because the I, the iPad is really only just taking off that they're a little bit behind? I think right now the the publishers are work, working very hard to to go digital, but they are preoccupied with uh, current books, which is perfectly understandable because that's where the major um, sales are. But as an author, my focus is, of course, my own books. So uh, that's why I I wasn't able to to wait for too long to to publish all my back catalog titles. And also, it's it told me that. When I did go and discuss these plans with my publisher, then they uh, they then um, did take take up my back catalog. So I think a major point is that if authors show an interest in publishing themselves, then maybe it's easier than to actually get published by by, by the publisher. I mean, having their ebooks published as well. And what feedback did? Um your um, your readers give you obviously direct feedback when you publish direct to the iBook store. But did they did you find they wanted more interactivity or more elements that come only with digital? Certainly, the 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 one book that uh, was made through Udo, which has a read aloud track, has been very popular, and I think uh, readers have been very pleased that it's possible to have the the, the book read to them. I haven't really investigated other interactive features, so I'm not the right person to to ask this. And also, I find that actually we know very little about how children respond to ebooks. Right now, I've, I'm trying to conduct an informal survey where I give away free books to schools around Denmark, and then in June we'll uh, we'll have reports coming in, and they'll tell me if children really like to read on the screen on the iPad. Uh, it's it's a it's a bit too soon to to really make a judgment. Mm. Anne, can you help us out here? You must have done your research when publishing um, your titles um, late last year. What what sort of feedback were you expecting, and what what did you get? Well, again, I think it's quite difficult. I think the younger market is is possibly um, I think easier to see because, as I said earlier, um, it seems to me I see a lot of kids. I mean, literally eighteen months upwards. Um, sitting on their parents' knees or whatever, playing with iPads, um, a lot of very young interactive stuff. Um, it's not so evident, kind of 7 to 10, which is what we're looking at, which is why I was pleasantly surprised by how many titles this sold, particularly in the twists range. Um, it kind of surprised me because obviously there's a market out there somewhere. There must be 7 to 10-year-olds sitting you know, with their presumably their parents' iPads. I mean, again, we're into generation three now, so they do tend to trickle down. So um, and I'm reliably informed. We've done some research in schools, and it's amazing the number of kids plus 11 plus who actually have iPads. Um, but generally, I think that particularly the interactivity, they love. I mean, I think I don't think, you know, we we present it to kids, and they're they're just incredibly interested. But they are very demanding. Um, I mean, they never they're always like, well, doesn't it do that, or why doesn't it do that? And so I think you have to realize your market um, because of uh, games and that kind of thing. So they're very demanding. So you, you, they're not satisfied with um, something that's very minimal. And when you get to seven to ten year olds plus um, and older. Um, but again, I think it's very difficult at this stage to say. And I think with the iPad 3, I think the iPad will start trickling down. So they'll go into the family more where you've got an iPad 3, you won't mind so much your kids mucking around with the iPad 1. And I think, I think, I think with a bit of his, historical, um, there's a bit of history behind them, I think they'll begin to be slightly used. And can you give a li little bit more information about the, the cost of doing this? Um, I mean, you're fairly unusual in that you've got one big title. So all the cost is sort of loaded against that. But is, is the cost in the creation, or is it in the, the marketing and then the ongoing support? Or are there other hidden costs that we don't know about? Well, it's, a lot is in the creation. I must admit, we haven't put a lot in the marketing budget at this stage, because again, it's quite difficult to know exactly how to be. I mean, it's different, because we are a big brand. So we have a lot of exposure. Um, you know, millions of people f footprints through the museums. We have our book, which does go out to a million people. It's it's not. I think it's slightly different from other publishers. Um, so we are. You know, we have 
Twitter feed, we have big websites, so there's an awful lot going on in our business. We have Facebook, we have lots of followers. So that kind of generates quite an enormous amount of um, exposure um, as it is. So it's, I don't think we have the same problems as perhaps smaller publishers um, who are just truly publishers. Um, but the, at the moment, the only cost we've kind of allocated against it is the creation of the actual title tick layout, and that's not a great amount, um, not when you can put it against the creation of the actual physical book, which is a nine-month or a year production and um, is quite, ex you know, quite, quite a, a lot of money. So, um, no, I mean, it, to us it was just if we, if we read the cost of the tick layout, it will be great. We've done that and we're going to do more. So, uh, and then you say, or you suddenly sort of realize, well, this book's not going to be around for the whole year rather than just two or three months at the bookshop. So there's all sorts of payoffs, um, which are good. But I don't think we react like a normal traditional publisher because of our exposure to the public generally. Mm. And you won't, you won't talk about sales figures in particular, but are, are they in, in digital format a good proportion of what you'd expect to sell in print? Is, is it reaching a kind no, of... No, no, no. no. It's, not, it's nothing like that. Absolutely nothing mm. like that because... Um, you know, we've built up this followers. We, we do um, over a million, including foreign rights and everything else, a year. So it's nothing like that. And I wouldn't expect it to be at this stage. And particularly because our books are kind of um, the type of book you pick up and you flick through. It's not, I wouldn't have thought, you wouldn't expect it necessarily to be the kind of book that you might actually put on the iPad, I think, because it's a present. It's, um, it's a big Christmas market. People get it for Christmas presents. It's not quite the same as getting it on an iPad, so I wouldn't expect it to translate across. But having said that, it looks very, very good on the iPad, and we are picking up quite a lot of traction, and a surprising number of people are downloading it onto their iPads. And have you experimented with different price points, or, or how did you work out the price for the digital version? Oh, <laughs> I, wish I, could, I, wish, I wish I could say there was a science. As I said, I, I did lots and lots of research, an enormous spreadsheet, looking at what other publishers are doing and how it compares to hardbacks across all the markets, America, the UK, and realized there wasn't really any kind of, um, you couldn't, you couldn't, there was no system, there was no equation. So we did what, I mean, literally what we felt was right compared to the book and what it sells in the market. It retails in the UK at 20 pounds and it sells for, say, 10 pounds across the big supermarket. So you had to think about that and balance actually what it felt like not to have the book and it, it was very much sort of um, testing the water, and we're still doing it. We're still looking at it and wondering if we bring it down or bring it up. Um, I think there's a lot of experimentation, but I, you know, it's, it's quite difficult. There's, it's, 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 it's instinct, which isn't really based on an awful lot at this stage. Mm. Have you changed the price since you published it? Not the, not the annual, but we have tested the twist, the eight twist, which is interesting because there are um, the wild animals is by far the most um, popular, um, are followed by, I think, human body and dinosaurs, which are traditional subjects which always do well in the market anyway. So we have been testing, one of them we've been testing, uh, reducing it and increasing it and doing things like that just to see what happens. I mean, just as we do with our app, we're, just, we're actually doing a big app program, but the, our app, we did the same thing by making it free and then charging, and it's surprising what kind of um, increased exposure you can have in that increased download just by doing that. So it's almost like you need to think about it every week, which we don't have the time to, but there has to be some kind of strategic plan, I'm sure, built in, just to keep moving them up and down and seeing um, seeing how they do. Mm. And have you, when, when you when you looked at price, when you experimented at price, did, it, did, did sales go up when you brought the price down, or and was yeah. there? Was oh, there? yeah, yeah, we, we, we did. We did one, quite, and it was quite good having the eight. It's not like you've just got one, but we had the eight as a series. So, we took the four most popular ones and experimented with those, and it was very interesting to see. We brought them down, the sales did not not dramatically, but they they, they went up. Mm. Morton, have you have you looked at the price of, of your digital um, versions? Have you experimented in the same way? I I made the choice from the start that uh, I would need to have quite low prices, so I I priced my my picture books to. Um, uh, I think two British pounds, and then my longer books to five British pounds, and uh, that seemed to be a, a good price point because uh, what I'm seeing right now is that the major publishers are coming down towards that price point now. Good news for you, maybe not for the major publishers. Well, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, 
we we don't know the 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 price points for the future. I think it's not I think it's not uh, impossible that uh, we'll have to make very cheap books for now, and then later we can raise the price point. But maybe I'm I'm completely off target here. I don't know. No, no, I think that's a, a well-worn strategy. Um, just, a, just a quick one. Someone's asking, what would you expect to sell in, in terms of your print books, and, and have you found any of your e-books more popular as as in digital than they were in print? Yes, I have. Um, it's a little bit special in Denmark, I think, because uh, mostly my books are made uh, for the the public market, the school market, the, the school libraries, and. Uh, Usually they have had a, a, a good run there, but uh, taking them, the print books, taking them to a uh, bookshop is, has proven more difficult, maybe because of the subject matter, matter. But now I can put my books on sale on the iBook store and, and sell directly to parents, and they've proven more successful than I thought, actually. I thought they were more of a niche product, but, but not so much. I spoke to... Uh to a, a, a writer of women's commercial fiction, and she found that um, when with the with the cover having come off for the ebook versions, they don't look like women's fiction anymore, and therefore she's getting a lot more um, male readers than previously. So um, maybe the marketing that we do around these books sometimes misses the audience that we don't know about. Richard, I've got a question for you. Do you think the um, the the with with more app creation going on and with fixed format production costs? likely to come down. Do you think overall the costs of producing these kind of books, whether they be apps or um, fixed format books as e-books, do you think the costs will come down? Um, I think there's a, there's a limit to where you can take fixed format down um, because we're trying to create something that is produ being produced in InDesign with all the perfect layout and, and, and the settings and the fonts, etc., and trying to create that in an HTML page which um, you know, websites are never created with that degree of care and attention. But as, as Anne was saying before, and the important thing of keeping that quality there is, is you know, it takes work to do that. So I think for fixed page layout, the, um, there's a limit to how far it can fall, but certainly it will fall as uh, we've developed, um, for example, um, some software techniques to enable us to do that. And that has enabled us to, to be more efficient in what we're doing. And others will do the same, I'm sure. So, but there's, there's a limit because of the, just the nature of how that's done. As far as um, apps are concerned, I think definitely we will find that falling because the app solution is is um, more software driven, more automated. And I, I think uh, the container app that will contain you know, 100 books, there's a huge amount of benefits from putting 100 books in there than putting in, say, just say three or four books. And the, the price or the payback falls dramatically as you put more books into into an app. Um, so you amortize that over the cost of the books. And I think as, as apps become more popular for uh, putting collections of books or things that are connected together, we'll find that that becomes a very cost-effective way of, 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 uh, of doing it. it and uh, it's all about, uh, and as people get better at methods of discoverability, I think that will, will work better. So I think, yes, price will come down, animation costs will fall. Um, templated ways, ways will look less templated and look more exciting for, 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 for viewers. So I think there's, uh, there's, it, it will continue to fall, but I think the fixed layout has a, uh, a flaw that will be difficult to go below to get down to the sort of anywhere close to the numbers that we see in, for example, in standard EPUB. And are, are, are costs being added to as new um, tablets come on the market? You mentioned the uh, bespoke format for the um, Kindle Fire is that is is that is that a heavy additional cost? Do you think? Yes, it is. It's it's you know you have to more or less the code has to be um, more or less done again. So there are obviously some administrative things that can be um, can can be uh, provide some sort of synergy. But as far as the code is concerned, I think this is one of the big problems that um, that we see uh, as the sort of technology providers is the problem for publishers is that. A lot of these uh, um, major players in the market, whether it be Amazon, uh, Google, or or, um, or Apple, do not see the value for them strategically in providing a standardized solution. They see that as being as the route to commoditization and their margins falling. So they are more or less trying to keep things very much according to 
platform and their own um, structure, and that's that's difficult for publishers. Um, <coughs> where, <coughs> where we try and spend our energy is trying to do the heavy lifting to try and convert things as automatically as possible so that in app terms, for example, you will be able to publish on Microsoft and on Android and on iOS platforms literally with a click of a button. That's the sort of job that we do. However, for, for example, KF8 for Kindle and the uh, fixed layout, that sort of um, way of conversion at the moment so far, even our sort of uh, clever guys have not found a way of doing that and we're sort of going to look at it, but it looks much more difficult to do it that way. Apps are more easy for us to be able to say that we can publish across platform, but it's, it's a big uh, issue for publishers, this proliferation of different platforms and, uh, and different systems that you need to do to create it, and that will push up the cost. And in, 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 in America, are there, are there more platforms established? So you've got the Nook, you've got the Amazon, you've got the iPad, uh, compared with the UK where you've only got um, Kobo Box and um, the iPad. Is that market now becoming more established and more um, more useful to publishers? Is it, is it a broader market in the US now? I think there is, I mean the Nook is the thing that's, that's the standout difference between the marketplaces um, and, and more recently the Kindle Fire. Um, the, um, Kindle Fire is designed by Amazon to be a content absorbing device. You know, you have to sign in with your Amazon account when you go onto that device. And it is about uh, consuming Amazon based content. And so that the um, uh, and in the States they have a lot more video content, a lot more t TV shows and all those things that they want to make money on. And we often think about them being used for publishing. Amazon is looking at it in those in in the sense of the other products. So they subsidize the cost of the Kindle based upon the amount of content that is going to be downloaded. It's questionable whether they can do the same thing in the UK because the amount of video content and other gaming content, for example, in the UK, Amazon App Store is much less than the US. So they will not get the same payback and therefore subsidizing it um, may not be such a great idea in Europe. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's been delayed in its launch while they work out the economics. So I think the American marketplace, to answer your question, has got more diversity because of um, Amazon's launch of the fire and because of Barnes & Noble being the strong player in the, in, in the States with their Nook. And the Nook has proved remarkably popular. And, uh, and I think your color, which is the one that we're talking about that can do this, is, is a very nice device. And it's actually selling very well against the, the Kindle Fire. Those are both smaller devices. So the US market is more. It's, it has got more devices out there. Um, of course, it's a hugely larger market than we have in the UK. Mm. And the Nook color might be heading over here sooner rather than later. I think it would be a very good thing if it did, actually. I think it's a very good device, and I think uh, it would be logical if uh, somebody like Waterstones decided to take that on. <laughs> it would be logical. Um, Morton, um, just a question from another author who's thinking of self-publishing. Is, is this something that, uh, uh, that you think other authors should experiment with? Yes, I, I, I definitely think so. Um, I guess you have to be prepared that uh, there is a risk that uh, virtually nothing will happen. Um, so it all depends on uh, do you have a good connection with uh, a readership uh, already or you're starting from scratch. But um, then again, you can always self-publish the ebook and uh, see how it goes and then take it to a publisher later. There are different ways of doing things now, I guess. Mm. And, and Anne, probably a last question for you. What would you recommend in, when looking for a, a developer partner with this kind of project if you're a traditional publisher? Or, and what, what, what should you avoid? Uh, what, you mean for making e-books? No, when looking for, for someone to develop an e-book with or, or a, a, a technological partner. Um, what do you mean like, like you do or somebody like that? What one should look for? Yeah, or an app developer or, you know. Something yeah, like an app developer. Well, um, our app developer, a very close relationship. I mean, we are particularly interested in 
state-of-the-art stuff. So um, I'm very interested in people who really have got their finger on the pulse and know what's going to happen next so that we can be there at the start line. So the people, the developers we're working with on our apps are very young, very creative, um, you know, networking three times a week um, and very keen. Um, and I suppose if you do, I have to say that's our only experience, um, of, they've done some in the States. But I suspect for us, the, the most reassuring thing was the fact that there's a very high level of checking that seems to go on because I think without that and quality, it would be, it could be a nightmare. The quality of the work that came through, and I think I said this last time, a year ago, it got better and better and better. And now the last books that came through with UDA, there was virtually nothing wrong with them. And that was very reassuring um, and actually saved um, a lot of time. But I think it's, you know, make sure you work with good people who know what they're doing and you, you, you don't spend half your time sending corrections back. And with apps and things like that, for me, it's getting the people who really are at the forefront and who are just totally immersed in the subject, young, exciting, creative. And, and that's, that's the kind of people we look for and we work with. Okay, I think I'm going to wind that up now. Thank you very much. Thank you to Richard and, and Morton. Um, a recording of this will be made available to anyone who's registered um, uh, beforehand. All those off to Bologna, good luck, um, and um, thank you once again for attending this You Do Bookseller webinar on the children's ebook market. I found it fascinating, and it really does look like it's going to take off this year. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Thank you. Thank you.